Well, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. And I just wanted to do something a little different this morning. I wanted to show you inside the engine room of somebody that is trying to accomplish a PhD. Now, it's quite a journey before you qualify for one of these, but I just want to show you where I'm up to with mine. I'm going to introduce you to what has to happen. Now, it's a Doctor of Theos Philosophy, a PhD in Theology. The purpose. The purpose of the Doctor of Philosophy, PhD program is to provide an opportunity for the student on a postgraduate level to achieve primacy in a discipline of ministry and leadership through original research and creative work in that area of ministry as demonstrated by a completed doctoral dissertation. Now I've done the uh, bachelor's and the master's and the doctorate. This is when you can apply for these higher forms of education, which is in this case the PhD in theology and the philosophy. The nature of the program. The Doctor of Theos Philosophy degree is a 54 credit program beyond a master, which combines 27 credits in core courses, 9 credits in special topics, 4 credits in guided readings, and 14 credit dissertation of 75 words, 75,000 words minimum, which has got to be produced as a book, using the approved style of writing a 5 chapter dissertation. This research degree has a primary emphasis on leadership in research within various areas of ministry. Each step of the doctorate is supervised by the faculty mentors, one chosen by the student to serve as a reader, and one by the university who will serve as chairman of the committee. Now, the admission. For admission to Doctor of Philosophy PhD program, the candidate must have a master's degree in appropriate discipline. A complete transcript of previous academic work is to be submitted before an application can be acted upon. These transcripts will be evaluated in terms of the entrance and graduation requirements of the university, with due allowances for equivalencies. Now this is the program, um, and I'll come up to where I'm up to shortly. I'll just show you... Um, We'll just read through this. Doctor of Philosophy PhD Program Description The Doctor of Philosophy PhD Program is divided into four components. Number one, core courses. Number two, special topics. Number three, guided reading. And number four, doctoral dissertation. So, you have a proposal and then you have the dissertation. And that's... Um, a guess or an allowance of how much time they think that you will take, but it's usually more than that. In some cases less, but usually more. Now the Doctor of Philosophy PhD Component 1. Doctor of Philosophy PhD Component 1 Core Courses. Now this is where I'm up to, but I'm up to the last one. I'm up to this one. So I've done the previous eight and I'm up to number nine cl 709 um, each of these comes at a price um, each time you write a uh, thesis you have to pay for it to be marked um, and it's not cheap and i won't tell you how much it is but it does cost um, the first one was spiritual formation um, the second one was the christian life and evangelical spiritual theology the third one was church administration and leadership. The fourth one was interpersonal communication and conflict management. The fifth one was advanced leadership and administration. Um, I got around 85% for mine. Um, the sixth one was spiritual leadership formation and basic principles. The seventh one was Christian ethics, which was very interesting. Um, the eighth one was the missionary encounter with world religions. And the one I'm working on at the moment, um, unfortunately, which I've lost a big part of because the computer shut down, um, but that's the way it goes, was uh, advanced spiritual leadership formation, which is a very interesting subject. 
Um, then it goes on to say the doctoral student must submit a bibliography of the books used for the core courses papers. So you'll have at the end of it the books and the internet references and all that stuff that you use to prove that you've done research into the subject. Note the word count does not include an introduction, appendices, embedded scripture, quotations, endnotes, footnotes, bibliography, or the such or the such like. The word count is taken from the contents of the chapters only, which means you could use, as you'll see when, in a minute, um, quotes from outside sources, but those quotes don't count in the word count of the paper. They only count the words of your thoughts in the paper. Um, now, once you get through this part, then you've got to pick, and this is what it says, so I'm up to the last one of these, and I've got a way to go because I lost most of it when the computer shut down. The doctoral, so then I've got to go on to this, Doctorate of Philosophy, PhD, Component 2. The, doc, the doctoral student will select three special topics from the list below. A 5,000 word paper is to be written on each of the three special co topic courses, covering the topic thoroughly. Each special topics course is worth three credits. And again, you have to pay for these to be marked, and it's not cheap. And here's a whole list of things. I haven't decided which three I'll pick, but just to give you an idea, you've got philosophy of corporate management. I won't do that. You've got philosophy of personal management. I won't do that. You've got business, business law and ethics for church administrators. I won't do that. You've got clinical applications of counselling in the church. I may do that. You've got psychopathology, sin and demonic influence. I probably will do that. You've got psychotherapy, pastoral counselling and inner healing. That's a possibility for me. You've got psychology and theology, a personal integration, which is one that I'll definitely do. Then you have personality theory, uh, theory and development, which I will not do. Uh, then you've got human behavior, uh, psychology of learning, philosophy, philosophy of learning, educational leadership, higher criticism, biblical exegesis, and textual criticism. You've got contemporary theology and evangelical belief. You've got church history and modern religious movements. And then you've got creationism, evolution, and biblical theology, which I think a lot of people would find an interest. And then you've got practical theology, contemporary methodology, and church life. I think I'll hover around the um, psychology, uh, psychopathology realm. Probably um, these three here is where I'll go. Now, after you've completed those successfully, then you come into component three. And the guided readings for the Doctor of Philosophy PhD reflect on areas of research which is directed toward the writing of the doctoral project. The student is to choose a minimum of 25 sizable works approved by the principal to read and write on. So you've got to write on the 25 books that you choose, which means you'll take quotes from those books to prove as evidence that you've used these books to construct the twenty-five or the seventy-five thousand word paper. Um, now this is just the introductory part, so you'll have to do. A, it says the minimum size of the work is five thousand words, which is to um, say what you're going to write about and so on and so forth from the twenty-five sizable works that you're going to use in the seventy-five thousand word thesis. I hope that makes sense. The writings must be comprehensive enough to cover the topic. Uh, this primarily constitutes Chapter 2 of the Doctoral Project. The completed guided readings are a part of the Doctoral Project and lead toward candidacy status. So up to this point, you still haven't qualified to do the Doctor of Theolo Philosophy in theology, as it were. Um, you've got to get through this part before you qualify for the Component 4. And that's the doctoral proposal. Now, the student is then is 
to then write a proposal for the doctorate describing the project according to the prescribed format. The minimum size of the dissertation is 75,000 of your own words with your choice of subject. An outline must be submitted for approval to the office and the decision on the suitability of the subject rests on the principal and is final. Guidelines for writing the thesis are contained in the booklet Student Study Helps and Hints and is provided for the student. For further copies are available from our office. Note, and they always put this, the word count does not include embedded scripture, quotations, and notes, footnotes, bibliography, introduction, appendices, all the such like, and are counted from the contents of the chapters only. The completed proposal is to be approved by the doctoral committee. The process and format for a doctoral proposal are described in Research Writing Made Easy and the paper titled Steps to Completing Your Doctoral Project Dissertation. And then it goes on to the fees. And then this is the construct so far of my CL709 Advanced Spiritual Leadership Formation um, thesis. Um, it's only new and fresh. I did lose, what did I lose? Probably about a thousand words, <coughs> which um, is very unfortunate. But I've started off in the direction of um, where did advanced spiritual leadership or human leadership begin? And I've come up with the subheading divinity and the human dilemma. Now this subheading will later be put in under contents, but not at this stage because I construct the thesis and all its subheadings and then I come back and I copy it and I take it to the contents and I take out all the contents of the subheading and put leave the subheading title, which helps me construct the um, subheading list. Now, divinity and the human dilemma. Now, I'm just going to take you inside my mind a bit here. You can take it or leave it. It makes no difference to me. But it's just showing you what the possibilities are for a thesis um, what would you say? Production, as it were. A biblical, here we go. A biblical view regarding the origin of human leadership formation could be very well, or could be, could very well be substantiated as having its conception in the Garden of Eden. And then I've quoted Genesis 1 to 3 because you need to authenticate what you're saying. This could be a debatable view, but it does hold conjecture enough to rouse investigation and at least a moment of thought. Humanity in its unique design was given exclusive superior characteristics, qualities and aspects within its being that no other living creature would be given the privilege to possess. Humanity distinctly bore the image and likeness of God and its essential core unlike any other created being. And again, there's a authenticating scripture. These Bible insights construct the podium of which it is possible and plausible to array the divine leadership characteristics working within the character of humanity at the fall of mankind, which would, con con which would contribute to the distinct formation and de definite proof of the divine nature being established within and a comprehensive core part of humankind at the time of its colossal fall. A controversial and consequential human leadership decision that would determine the course of human history was made by Adam, Genesis chapter 3, ultimately leaving the divine Godhead no other choice but to physically intervene millenniums later, and we know that was the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm building a platform. In the garden, excuse me, I'm just going to um, hang on. In the garden initially, there was the deception of the woman as she ate, and after that, the deliberate choice of the man to eat. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.14 says that the woman was deceived, but the man deliberately ate, and it's a massive insight into what happened in the garden. But what is little thought about is the time period between 
when the woman ate and consequently when the man ate. Um, and all the decisions and possible derisions that took place within that duration of time. There is no definitive duration period, but what is certain is that a Adam ate after Eve, and the reason why he ate would, I believe, be morally more glorious and significant than when she ate. The text reads, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And there's the authenticating text. The scripture determines that Adam was with Eve when he ate, but it is not definite as to Adam's locality when she ate. I have speculated for many years in pondering on where Adam was during the deception discourse. Did Adam watch the deception? Why did he let it happen? Or was he doing something else? The fact of the matter is that there are many plausible assumptions, but I cannot find any conclusive facts of where he might have been, as there are none or there are not any in the Bible. All I must work with is the scriptures sorry, all I must work with is what the scriptures reveal about the nature and character of God and how this would have influenced the outcomes surrounding the fall of mankind, be it Adam, was created with the image and likeness of God. And that's still being worked on there. The fact remained that he ate after she ate. She ate without him. Yet after her fall, he positions himself alongside her to take his fall. This was very crucial in concluding the progress and ethnicity of Adam. Or eth that's supposed to be ethical. That's to do with ethics, right? His ethical decision to do it of Adam's leadership formation as parallel to the image and likeness of his creator. Of course, this view is arguable, but I put it forward for consideration. Then I've quoted an outside source to start building something um, along the lines of sacrifice and human instinct uh, and how that works. But I've quoted author Veronica Ross, who believed there are so many ways to be brave in this world. Sometimes bravery involves laying down your life for something bigger than yourself or for someone else. Sometimes it involves giving up everything you have ever known or everything you have ever loved for the sake of something greater. Life has taught me all about real sacrifice, that it should be done from love, that it should be done from necessity, not without exhausting all other options, that it should be done for people who need your strength because they don't have enough of their own. And then I close it with a footnote, which has to authenticate the quote, and I think we can go to the footnote, which is here, and that shows the university, where it come from, who wrote it, da, 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 and so on and so forth, okay? And then I put myself, Adam and Eve were in such a predicament of choice and consequence, and that'll be expounded on later. Then we have another subtitle, Humanity Managing an Inevitable Fall. Either Adam ate out of idiotcy, or an admiral prodigy of decision developed within him within him over the duration of Eve's post-deception and dilemma and his decisive decision of ultimately joining her in sin. She fell into sin alone, given that she ate before he did. Eve solitarily experienced sin completely and utterly alone and the only human that did. All other humans would have someone to share sin with, but this was not the case for her. She had concepted a new inherent sinful nature and carried it exclusively isolated. She had now inherited an unwanted nature that was irreversible, unbeknownst and evil. Consequence had dire begotten Eve after she ate, but until Adam ate, he was without sin and still in the glorious uninterrupted image and likeness of God. During these momentous, pivotal moments in human history, an observant and anticipating universal audience awaited how Adam would effectuate as a result of his colossal individual, or as a result of this colossal, which was her colossal, individual downfall. 
Given the fallen state of Eve, Adam is confronted with a profound, complexing and dire situation, and I'm sure you would agree. His pursuing decision would reveal the moral worth of his divine nature and character construct. The circumstances would illuminate and test his inner actuality in a way that no other matter of circumstances could have measured in its calibration to divine likeness. The contributing and primary influential factors motivating Adam's decision to join his woman in union of sin would consequently and spectacularly show us the extent of which the divine nature and character congealed within the matrix of his being and whether it was as God had intended and expected. Pretty full on, isn't it? Laying down, and that's to be worked on, and now we've come to laying down of life, because I wanted to come into what Jesus said. I wanted to make more of a biblical application, and I'm getting to the end of where I'm up to so far. There was another thousand words, but it's been lost. Um, but we'll go through this just to show you how I'm building into um, how what Adam did evolved around uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ taught, being the second Adam himself. So this is running off the subheading, laying down of life. The laying down of one's life is an important theme in the New Testament. And there's a authenticating scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ, along with the Apostle Paul and John, taught about this sacrificial idealism and when or where it should be applied, and there's authenticating scriptures. It's a principle based on extraordinary value for human life, a value that extends far beyond the core and quit essential survival and instinctive norm normalities of humanity. It is the ultimate demonstration of human origin in parallelism with that of the divine nature and divine expectation, surrendering your life even so far as death as a result of having ornate value for someone or others brings with it divine prize and honour on entering eternal life. And there's an authenticating scripture. What Adam was going to do by deliberately eating of the Lord God's original command would intrinsically foreshadow dramatically the master plan of God's redemption, wrath, reconciliation and salvation plan in Christ. As the Father loved me, Jesus said, and then I've put in a scripture now, I've got to build around this scripture because this is the motivation behind Adam eating, which a lot of, unfortunately, uh, most of the church world don't realise. They think that Adam just ate because he was stupid. Adam ate because he loved Eve, and this is not very well known or taught because it's too hard to try and communicate it. But you've been given, free of charge, um, a look inside the engine room of a theologian or theologist's head that's done their work properly. So what Adam was going to do by deliberately eating of the Lord God, against the Lord God's original command would intrinsically foreshadow dramatically the master plan of God's redemption, rough reconciliation and salvation plan. And I've jumped on to a passage here from the Gospel of John. Um, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, which you have to be very careful about these passages with the word commandments, because the commandment for Jesus was to love your neighbor as yourself, which um, can stretch out to uh, sacrificing your life for somebody else and so on and so forth. So what I've done there, viewers, I've shown you just out of, um, I thought it would have been interesting for some people to see what you need to go through to get these qualifications and the expense. I didn't want to go into the expense because it's a little bit too personal. It's a lot of money. Um, but I'm just showing you um, what these people are trying to do um, and what you have to go through to prove yourself as being um, ethical and well learnt in the understanding of the scriptures. Um, it's a long journey. It's, it's It can be very difficult at times, um, but it can be very rewarding as well. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure there's a few comments to be made on that. Um, and maybe there's other, I don't know, look, look somebody could, look, there's always going to be somebody better and always going to be somebody worse. 
that's just my take. And what the thesis will unfold into is the fact that Adam did what Jesus did, and that's the core of Christian leadership, to put others before yourself. He didn't just eat because he was an idiot. He ate in the image and likeness of God. He ate because he loved his wife. When Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross and suffered um, sin upon himself. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that he might become the right, that we might become, beg my pardon, the righteousness of God in him. Adam did exactly the same thing but for Eve because he loved her so much. See, our identity, men, is not based on intelligence or intellect. It's based on um, loving, loving our wife before ourselves, loving our wife as Christ loved the church. Um, that should give us enough calibration in our identity to love the way that we should. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison. I hope you enjoyed that. A um, bit of a look inside the engine room in the mind of somebody that's trying to um, have, you know, qualifications in our subject. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like, um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one of life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.